Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Torch Theatres Knowledge Exchange event. Entitled, rather ominously, It'll Never Work on Zoom, Learnings in Online Participation. My name is Wes Williams. I'm the director here at Torch or at Torch in the Oxford Research Centre for the Humanities. At Torch and through the Humanities Cultural Programme, we generate a range of cultural activities fueled by research. Knowledge exchange projects such as this involve collaboration between researchers and external organisations or individual members of the public, including artists and writers and dancers and so on. This event series is supported by the university's KE, so Knowledge Exchange Seed Fund, and gives me the opportunity to say that through our knowledge exchange work with theatres and performers, we're constantly seeking new ways to enrich collaboration with the university. So send us more ideas if you have them. Today's event has been created to hear from people who've been at the forefront of online creative participatory work this past year. Over the next hour and a half then, we'll listen in on two pairs of conversations as they discuss the, speak, uh, the challenges of this past year. Online participation programs have of course been vital for arts organizations and individual artists, and indeed uh, the public who uh, engage with our work to stay connected to communities with whom they have spent years building relationships. We'll hear from two leading lights in the Oxford art scene about their experiences. Researchers have also pushed forward with creative practice as research, the projects burgeoning despite the challenges of the pandemic. And we'll hear later on about a collaboration with hip hop theater company, Body Politic, one of the best names for a company in the world, I think. We invite you to ask your questions throughout the webinar via the Q&A function. And towards the end of the session, our theaters officer, Ruth Moore, will put your questions to the panel and ask you, the audience, to share with us your experience of this kind of work. <clears throat> so to our first conversation, it's between Emmy O'Shaughnessy, and Paul Simpson. And I'll wait uh, as uh, each of them comes on screen in turn. Emmy O'Shaughnessy is the joint CEO, hello Emmy, um, joint CEO of the Arc T Centre in Oxford. Arc T uses the powers of creativity and human connection to change lives and to inspire community driven social change. Across a broad range of projects, Arc T aims to improve well being and the quality of life to grow diverse leadership, cultivate inclusion in the arts, and to develop and co-produce outstanding community art, which they've been doing so for a good number of years. Emmy has been CEO for five years, and sadly for us, but not only sadly, obviously, will soon be taking on the role of Director of Innovation and Growth for Oxfordshire Youth. Thanks, Wes. Good to see you. Thank you. Paul, Paul Simpson is participation manager at Oxford Playhouse. Oxford Playhouse, as we know, offers year round activities for people of all ages to take part in at the theatre, in the community, as part of Oxford Playhouse plays out and so on, and also online. For young people beginning their creative journeys, for adults nurturing lifelong passions, and for schools looking to inspire their pupils, as well as for community partners supporting the most vulnerable people in our region. Oxford Playhouse's program of activities looks to engage, educate, and empower everyone through creativity and storytelling. So both ArcT and Oxford Playhouse are long-standing practitioners and researchers in this field. They're also long-standing friends and partners of Torch, and we're delighted to have you both, uh, Paul. Hello, Paul. Hello, um, thank you, Wes. And Emmy, uh, to reflect on this past year. I'm going to disappear from screen and let you guys get on with the conversation. Over to you, Emmy and Paul. Thank you. It's so good to be here. And Paul, I know that you and I have been connected now for quite a while and our organisations are, as Wes said, um, friends and partners. Uh, we both share such a passion for inclusion, especially in the arts. And um, I thought it would be useful to start from that point because um, it was the raw partnership that I think really brought our organizations together 
Um, and just for people who are attending the webinar, hello to everybody. Um, the Raw Partnership was founded in 2016 when ArcT um, recognised that there was a huge issue with the lack of inclusion for disabled children and young people in the arts in Oxfordshire. And so we founded a festival called Raw um, and also a partnership um, of disability and cultural organisations to come together and see how we could improve um, access uh, across the county. And um, Paul, you and I got together because you really brought OP into that partnership um, just before the pandemic hit really. Mm. And I know we've had the success of bringing the Royal Partnership online as well, but um, to start off with, I would just, I'd love to hear you talk about those early weeks um, when we, both of our organisations found ourselves in completely foreign territory of being organisations that are passionate about bringing people together in live physical spaces and, and watching the magic of creativity and human connection bring communities together and um, spark amazing things. And we, we were suddenly faced with completely unprecedented scenario of having to still do the work we're so passionate about but with absolutely no experience <laughs> at all in how to do it can no. you take, take us back to those first few weeks after the first lockdown what was happening at op what were the plans that were being put into place well um those first two weeks were you know at, at the time felt like real chaos because as you say emmy it was real foreign territory it was um it presented us with barriers that I don't think anybody in our organization would have ever anticipated. Um, we were instructed to close, theaters across the country were instructed to close uh, a week before the first full national lockdown. Um, and by the end of the first week of that national lockdown, um, I'm very pleased to say that we were able to uh, present an alternative to, to what we would have normally done. But those 10 days of work, um, I look back now with such fondness and such pride at how fantastically resilient and passionate and determined every single member of the Oxford Playhouse team and community were in just making it happen. And that's something I've always loved about theatre and, and just kind of the arts in general is that, you know what, we will make it happen because, you know, sometimes the product isn't the important thing. It's, it's those other things. It's the community and it's the determination to work with people, as you've said, Emmy, of, of you know, reaching out and, and trying to remove barriers. That's, that's where, you know, for us, we knew we had to move forward. Um, and yeah, those, those two weeks, how much learning, I, I imagine it's similar for, for all of you at ArcT as well, the amount of learning that we had to do. You know, theatre is about an in-person live experience. And, you know, you hear actors and audience members talk all the time about that kind of electric feeling of being present in a space with other people and, you know, finding that sense of community and, and you know, togetherness with others. And, COVID-19 just seemed to put a stop to all of that. But then we kind of questioned that and thought, no, in, in the participation work the Playhouse does, we're used to challenging and confronting barriers. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose of why we exist. And I, I know it's the purpose of why ArcT exists as well, removing those barriers to ensure that people feel included and feel like they're a part of something. And this was just another barrier for us to, to confront and to challenge. And, and we knew it wasn't impossible. We knew we could do it. We knew that it was something that we were determined to get through. Um, and yeah, I'm so proud of everything that the whole Oxford Playhouse team was able to achieve in such a quick amount of time and just get us back online and back talking to our communities, really. Um, I I've, I've got to say, I was so um, impressed when I was watching it all unfold kind of on social media in terms of your response time and obviously being theatre makers your skills in improv improvisation would have come, come, <laughs> back, come um, into, into the fore really um, but I agree there was such a staggering amount of resilience and I don't know about you but I think this overwhelming sense of responsibility that we felt at ArcT to connect as quickly as possible mm -hmm. to our projects and to the 
children, young people and young adults that we have worked with for years, we just felt this um, urgency around trying to find ways that we could show them that they were still very much at the forefront of our minds and that keep sustaining people's creative um, inspiration and activity just felt so important. And then alongside that, we just felt so compelled to do everything we could, even though we're you know, a pretty small grassroots organization to keep artists in paid work because we could mm -hmm. see what was happening nationally. And we knew that the impact was going to be so huge on freelance artists. And we were really determined, you know, to do as much as we could to get artists um, up and working as quickly as possible. Um, and I know that that was something that OP were really passionate about too, um, because, you know, our artists are the lifebloods of the sector, really. Um, Completely. Absolutely. And we had so many people to protect, didn't we? We, we? we needed to make sure that we were looking after everyone in our communities, our staff, as you say, our artists and, uh, you know, the communities that we, we serve as well. So there was this real sense of responsibility. You're absolutely right. And, it, uh, you know, likewise, Emmy, it was, it was so great to see the responses that ARC-T in that time were able to, to respond to as well. Well, we were in a bit of a different position to you because because of our size, we actually weren't able to adapt online as quickly. We had to put as many staff on furlough as we could um, because we lost our venue higher income for our two centres overnight. 100% of our unrestricted income was gone. So we, unfortunately, in the, those first few months, um, we weren't able to move um, online apart from our one-to-one -one mental health um, support sessions mm -hmm. um, but we what we did do was um, work collaboratively with you and other arts organizations to distribute creative packages full of materials um, particularly for disabled young people mm -hmm. but you were able to move things onto zoom really quickly weren't you and I know that Keen is one of the partner organizations you work with how quickly mm -hmm. were you able to get that project up and running and what did that look like on zoom yeah absolutely um keen for those of you who aren't familiar with the organization is uh, uh, it's a, a charity based here in oxford uh, and i know there are other centers around the country as well um, that we both emmy and i work with as part of the raw partnership um keen provides opportunities for uh, young people adults uh, with disabilities who um are just looking for a chance to come together and that's kind of the spirit we went into this with. Uh, we knew we needed to get people together and Zoom provided an opportunity for us um, to be able to do that. Um, we took as much of our work online as we could. Um, our work with Keen is a, it's a, a weekly session now of kind of drama workshops and a chance for people to be creative and, and express themselves and use their voices and their bodies to tell stories still. Um, and that's kind of the spirit we, we, we really took with, with all of our opportunities, our in-house young companies, our adult company, you know, we're, we're still meeting weekly with our youth theatre groups. Um, we're still able to work with schools because of this online work. And, uh, you know, it, it's challenging. It absolutely is challenging. It was, I'd, I'd never heard the word Zoom before March 2020. It wasn't something I was familiar with, but learning about the the possibilities that we could do on this in this format was wonderful you know we are still able to make stories together and that's what theatre is about essentially you know being creative together and, and just coming up with an end product that's that's where we get to um you know so we, we were able to do that we we were able to use this as a as a, a format to do that and and still have an essence of it being live as well like you know you and i we're we're talking live now and and that's the only real difference between theatre and film is that we're able to do it in the moment and you know that that's kind of what what we've led with and and actually this has presented us with an opportunity to reach out to more people than ever before you know the, the barriers that existed before covid of people maybe not being able to get to oxford city center for you know geographical or time related reasons you know that suddenly removed because people were in their own homes for the majority of the year and they were able just to click on a Zoom link and join us for the first time. Um, you know, we were able as well to reprioritize about who, who really needed our services. You know, Emmy, you were talking about the, the kind of one-to-one -one mental health provision. You know, we, we absolutely understood the, the, the real dangers of, of, of isolation during this time. And, 
um, you know, it, not on Zoom, but via the telephone, we found a brand new program with, with you know, later in life participants in our communities who are taking part in our Tea Talks project, which is, you know, specifically designed to reach out to, to people who are later in their lives who, who might be alone right now and might be very vulnerable. Um, you know, and, and, and it, it's these new ways of working and this new way of reaching out to people and, you know, the, the, the chance to reprioritize what and who we should really be focusing our, 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 you know, all of our efforts on. That's been a really wonderful, inspiring thing, you know, during the last year and keen as we started this conversation with has been a huge part of that. How can we really work with people who are vulnerable? Um, Emmy, what about you? I mean, I mean, you know, you, you were talking, weren't you, about how it, the process took a little bit longer because of, you know, the, the, the need to furlough staff. And, you know, we were in a similar situation at the Playhouse as well with furloughing and, and, and a, you know, a, a really upsetting redundancy process with some staff members. How did you overcome those challenges to get back online? Well, it was the Cultural Recovery Fund um, mm. that actually enabled us to bring staff members back so that we could start adapting our programs online. So I would say that from October 2020, that's when we really got going with our online Zoom um, workshops. So we um, were able to start weekly sessions back up with our teenage girls group, we, who are a visual arts group. International Young Company, which is a theatre multidisciplinary group for young people, was able to start back up then. Um, and also our youth music funded programme um, moved online. So quite quickly, we were in a position last autumn where we were offering a really rich kind of variety of Zoom participatory workshops. And I think one of the challenges for us was around safeguarding, actually. Mm -hmm and how we could ensure that we were carrying out our safeguarding kind of duties um, for young people when they weren't in a room together um, in the normal way that we've been doing things for years with policies and procedures um, and ways of working to keep people safe. So that was quite challenging because there was so much information and guidance coming through from different um, national bodies that advised around online safety. And so it really took us some time to piece together um, a new online safeguarding policy that could really mean that we were keeping young people and staff safe. And I think that's something I'd be really happy to speak on a bit later in the questions if anyone wants more details. But, you know, we got busy with creating kind of visual roadmaps of how a Zoom workshop would, would operate. And those got sent to all of the participants so they had time to understand what a session would look like and feel like. Um, in the Zoom world. And I think all of those things took time and resource and learning, but really helped us to feel prepared. Um, I do think we we're able to remove a lot of the barriers in terms of um, reaching young people who might have various um, access needs and wouldn't be able to come into our centres physically. We've definitely expanded um, the numbers of young people working with because of those reasons. But, you know, there have been ongoing challenges as well because there have been young people and young adults especially from um, our disability groups who've needed support with tech um, and that's required us to in some instances have artists going out and having COVID secure meetings on the doorsteps with participants and a family member or a personal carer mm -hmm. to establish what their tech needs are and for us as an art centre to think about how we can support those young people or young adults to be able to get online safely um, and consistently. So there were lots of logistical things that we had to work out as we went along and realised that some participants had dropped off, but we needed to go out and find out why. And often it was tech that was one of the barriers that we needed to work on. I don't know if that was similar for you. It was, it absolutely was. I mean, you know, in, in a very, very similar way to, to how you just described, I think obviously as we were trying to reimagine how we can deliver our work in an online format you know maybe in that early stage we had presumed um that you know there was a kind of universal a universal literacy of how to how to actually access platforms like this and um i i, I think i would certainly identify that that first couple of months of of delivering in this way was you know a real working out of actually where are the new challenges what 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 does technology present as a, as a new barrier to this you know some some people aren't confident using computers and for some people you know it's, it's an additional kind of foreign territory um and as you say emmy the the kind of the risks of being online 
you know they're they're ever present really aren't they and and yeah that's that's certainly not um, we're certainly not talking about this to kind of put anybody off working online it's it's just another barrier to kind of o- overcome um and similar to to yourselves at arc t you know we had to really you know create that roadmap of what does this session look like who can talk to who in a capacity that we're not maybe aware of and um, you know how how do we how do we kind of risk assess that? How do we ensure that people can still feel safe yeah. whilst being creative with one another? So what do you what's going to happen moving forwards with OP? Are you going to keep going online? Have you got a hybrid model, or what's <laughs> what what has been really gained from this experience that you're going to bring forward? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the entire theatre industry has responded so remarkably over the last year you know not actually being able to be in our buildings or you know for those who are theatre companies not being able to visit a a venue um and I think all of us have kind of surprised ourselves that actually you know what we can do it we can do it and and we're we're using that spirit to really propel us forwards and uh we're investing heavily in our kind of digital infrastructure at the playhouse now um a result you you mentioned just now, Emmy, the cultural recovery fund money, which was a huge, huge lifesaver for so many in the creative industries. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm so pleased that both of our organizations were able to benefit from that. Um, but it has allowed us to think about digital and it has allowed us to think, actually, we know what works online now. There are some groups that, you know, have even said to, to, to me and, and, and others in our organization that they don't need to come back to the building. It works for them in this way. They're able to be more flexible and they're able to be in some instances more expressive because they're in the comfort of their own homes um mm-hmm. you know that's that's wonderful that we are, we are able to kind of think about that hybrid you know nature and still reach out to people which i think is just the most important thing yeah um, how about how about yourselves at arc t well i i think that we are kind of very very hungry to get back in the space and actually to be <laughs> bringing people back together. However, especially with our youth music program, um, what we've learned is that there is some, there's a really strong appetite, particularly from some of our neurodiverse young people Mm. to continue having one-to-one sessions online um, because it really works in terms of reducing the amount of transition and change between environments and getting to know new people. Um, that the feedback has been really overwhelmingly positive about one-to-one online sessions for the music programme remaining. So um, one of the challenges that has been really present with that project has, is obviously that the, the sign, we do a signing choir, which works really well online, um, a BSL signing choir. What doesn't work well is being able to do all of the work with actual instruments because we can't send out we don't have the resources as a as a charity to be able to send instruments out to young people's houses so that is a real issue there are certain music genres it really works for and some it's just an absolute barrier that unless we get loads more money in to send out lots of equipment we we do feel restricted and i think the equipment thing is one of the challenges of um, moving participatory sessions online i mean the amount of time and resource we've we've had to give to artists to go and distribute materials um, across the community has been quite significant and that's something that needs to be taken kind of into account it can be overcome but it's a logistical um, need that is kind of unavoidable really but yeah. I think one of the things that I've been really impressed with in terms of the creativity of the artists running these sessions online is how to bring together some space in person and combine it with online and just yeah. before the webinar started I looked over and we've got this This was one of the products of our Zoom workshops um, with our international young company um, youth group and uh, the Her Space projects as well. And this was in partnership with the Bodleian Library and it was a zine by post project. So they produced work remotely, um, but then also were able to come together and produce a physical thing that was sent out to everybody. So I think finding ways to um, strengthen that really strong, strengthen that connection between participants Mm -hmm. and the outside world, but also be able to do what you can safely from home during lockdown, showed that there are kind of the possibilities are endless really. We had the Rawsons, our disability youth arts group met online all through the winter lockdown. 
And then once restrictions lifted, one of the members went out to Florence Park, a local park, and, and brought the artwork they'd made at home and did a bit of performance art with the artist in a kind of COVID secure way. So again, it's like kind of thinking about how we can be flexible and, and do as much as we can online for those that it really works for, but also bringing people back together um, in a safe way is really enriching. Absolutely. And I think it is that spirit, isn't it, that possibilities are endless. You know, we've, we've, we know what our commitments are and, and kind of, I guess, just to kind of round up this conversation, you know, we, we uh, both of our organizations have really powerful mission statements. You know, ArcTees is uh, creativity changes lives. Uh, the Playhouse, ours is a playhouse for everyone. And, you know, those are statements, you know, they're, they're things that we're very proud of and that we stand by and that we, you know, we, we, we're responsible for, but, you know, they're also things that hold us accountable. You know, both of our organizations where we're, we have a civic duty to, to kind of provide for the people around us. And, you know, that spirit that you were just talking about, the possibilities are endless. I think moving forward, Zoom is going to have a place within all of that, isn't it? As we return to the room even. And um, I really look forward to seeing, Emmy, what, what ArcT is able to do moving forward and what we can do in collaboration continuing as well. I know, well, we're thinking of Royal Festival actually being online this year, aren't we? Um, and not bringing it back into person. So I should say, actually, Torch have been an amazing support of Royal mm -hmm. Festival over the last few years, which we're really grateful for. And I know that they passionately believe in inclusion in the cultural world as well. So um, big thanks to Wes and the team at Torch for, for backing that work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's a nice transition into bringing Wes back in now, I think. Um, Thank you. Always Hi, happy to come back in. Hello. Um, <laughs> especially when thanks are being handed out. Um, that was really, really interesting. And also, I guess it left me with two kind of quick questions, one of which is actually already um, articulated um, uh, by one of the attendees. And that is, we've said Zoom in our title. Um, uh, is Zoom the only way to work online? Have you used other platforms? Is there experimentation to be done that's participatory outside of this, uh, this mode? Uh... We actually recently did something that I think a year ago we would never in a million years have dreamed of. So we planned for June 2020, we had um, planned something called the Festival of Teenagehood which in my mind was gonna be like a mini version of um, uh, a the type of festival you'd see at the South Bank, um, mm -hmm. which is like Women of the World. So lots of pieces of participatory art, all about the experience of being a teenager, very, very excited about it. And then COVID happened. Yep. And it wasn't until, um, you know, six or nine months into the pandemic that we realized we still really wanted to do this zoom was not going to work so we worked with a local organization called oxford media factory and produced the festival online which was cheaper i mean it was still it was still it still was pretty expensive but um mm -hmm. what it hit what it enabled um the young people on our projects to do was still have the experience of curating a festival um, and they were the live presenters. Mm -hmm. So we did lots of pre-recorded work of all of our different projects. Yep. Um, but they got this new experience, which they wouldn't have had if it was an in-live, uh, in-person event yep. of presenting the whole festival, kind of like a TV show. And also yep. now that's something that we have permanently on record. Um, so the quality of the production was really, really, really good. And I've seen another charity do something similar event wise, but it was nothing like Zoom and it required a lot more time and resource, but well worth it. Yeah, and just I to think jump in there really... as well about that pre-recorded activity. Uh, that's something we've certainly benefited from at the Playhouse as well, because an additional challenge that you know, Emmy and I didn't discuss in our conversation just now was actually for young people, they were doing all of their schoolwork online as well. And the kind of, you know, the, the fatigue that was that was starting to appear after kind of three or four weeks of working constantly online and then joining us in the evenings or weekends for, you know, Zoom workshops. Yeah. We realized we had to adapt to that as another barrier and that kind of pre-recorded activity, something that we could release as a kind of, you know, a, a, a more condensed workshop or activity that they could access on YouTube or through our website. 
was you know another way of kind of really tackling some of those additional barriers and also allowed us to kind of really commit to widening inclusion you know we were able through a pre-recorded activity to provide you know captioning and to provide those other additional things that you know are really important to enabling as much access as possible so yeah pre-recorded was good for us too yeah yeah i mean again i think we might come back to this in our last of these sessions in in a couple of weeks time about so-called farewell to zoom but what does hybrid actually mean hybrid obviously doesn't just mean um live streaming something that's happening live it means precisely putting together all sorts of different kinds of 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 pre-recorded pre-made but nonetheless as emmy said giving people the chance to still stand up and say i made this mm -hmm. um and to say that in front of other people um kind of in a in a virtual space in a real space um uh, as well as as you said paul giving people the chance to kind of go and make stuff on their own in what would have been the back room uh, you know the 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 the, um, the 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 carpentry shop or whatever it is, and then bring that to this space. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly that that um, we're going to be learning for a good few years about how to use that those different spaces in the same um, kind of in the same zone. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and yeah, it's not going to be a straightforward shift back to everybody being in the same room again um, because we'd lose so much, you know. Um, uh, there, there's so many gains in terms of participation and reach and uh, access in a really straightforward sense of not having to get the bus to go somewhere or not having to kind of make the journey into the room and all the rest of it. And there's there's value in that as well, I think. But um, uh, yeah, um, thanks ever so much for a really yeah insightful conversation. Um, there are there's one other question that has come in. Please do keep. The questions coming in we'll save up um simon we'll save up your question uh for later um uh and um because uh, i think it may yeah it may come back best as, as part of the final uh discussion towards the end um but i want to say thanks to emmy and paul and we'll take you off screen uh, now but bring you back again um in a little while for the final Thank discussion uh, at the end um <clears throat> and then we move then on to our second conversation um which is um, between uh, Dr. Baha Tunchgent and um, MJ Gregg. Um, and let's wait until they come on screen too. So um, Baha is a research fellow at the University of Nottingham and a research affiliate of the Social Body Lab here at the University of Oxford. Her research focuses on how people form social bonds, uh, cooperate and coordinate movement with each other to investigate social, sensory, and motor processes, the kind of thing I've been doing online like this, <laughs> amongst other things. Um, she's worked with infants, children, and adults from neurotypical and autistic populations. In her work, Baha integrates theories and methods from developmental and social psychology, neuroscience, and cognitive anthropology. Now, for those of us outside these fields, we might think that's a really obvious thing to do because it's about what it means to be human, but it's it's new work. And in a way, Baha's kind of leading the way in all sorts of interesting uh, fields uh, in this area. Not least by collaborating with the likes of MJ. Hello, MJ. Hello, Baha. Hello. Um, MJ Gregg is the founder and director of Body Politic, a professional hip hop theatre company based here in Oxford. One of the only female choreographers who's toured nationally outside of not only Oxford and or but also the Metropolitan Centre of London, MJ works collaboratively with creatives to approach taboo sociopolitic subject matter with an authentic flair for integrating narrative with hip hop and movement. Previously part of Oxford Dance Forum's producer support programme, associate artist at Swindon Dance and newly announced as Omnibus Theatre's company in residence, Body Politics' first full-length hip-hop theatre work, Father Figurine, embarked on a national tour to 10 venues across the UK in 2019. Like everybody else, they then had to somehow adapt to this new world. The, their project, Improving Young People's, so their joint, Bahar and um, MJ's joint project, Improving Young People's Mental Wellbeing through a dance programme, was funded by the Torch Theatre Seed Fund. Once again, I'll disappear from the screen and let's hear them talk about the experience. Over to you, Baha and MJ. Thank you very much. Um, 
I think we're going to start with a little little video uh, first, um, just so you can kind of see um, the project that we delivered online via Zoom um, that uh, both Baha and, and I sort of collaborated on, give you a little insight into what went on. Jane Gregg. I'm the Artistic Director for the Body Politic and one of the tutors um, on the project. So we submitted a proposal to the Oxford Research Centres in Humanities, also known as TORCH, and was successful, which was great because it meant that we got to talk about our amazing project that we were already doing, working with young people um, to use dance as kind of a tool as a vehicle to improve mental and physical well-being. We were able to link up with a researcher and put the work that we were already doing into a fully fledged research study, which is what we've been delivering over the past kind of 10 weeks. Yeah, very nice. My name is Bahar Tunchgenj. I'm a researcher of psychology at the University of Nottingham and at the Social Body Lab in the University of Oxford. This project is a brilliant way for me to explore some of the questions that I find most interesting in science. I'm interested in understanding how moving our bodies together with other people in coordination and in time to the same rhythms can help us connect with each other. And we had over 100 people, young people, sign up to be part of this project. So it was just really reassuring that the project is needed, that actually it was during so much uncertainty that young people really needed to feel like they were part of something, that they were moving their bodies, but also that they were connecting with other young people, they were connecting with an art form which they loved. I just found them really engaging. Um, and obviously they were different to like a usual class that I would do so that was nice especially using imagery to transfer them into movement which I really enjoyed. I think I gained like more confidence and stuff because when I first joined like the first lesson I was proper sweating and I didn't know what to do. I didn't even want to turn my camera on but now I'm, I'm nice and confident. Dance and the art has such a profound impact on young people. But to have some research to actually say, yes, like the arts are brilliant, <laughs> um, is just, yeah, is something that is, is really unique, I think, for this project. Um, and it's been such a pleasure to be a part of. So that was a nice intro. I don't think we need to introduce ourselves anymore after that. But MJ, maybe you can get us started by telling us a little bit about the history of the project. How did we meet? How did you come up with the idea of even linking up with a researcher? Yeah, so um, the actual kind of project, so Body Politic have been delivering um, our outreach project since 2017. Um, and it's a project that um, in person is uh, delivered in partnership with Dancing Oxford, so Oxford City Council and Access Sport. Um, and in particular, kind of, um, it's delivered in areas in, in within the community, so, or schools that the young people attend. So there's, a, like Emmy and Paul were talking about earlier that, you know, we're trying to reduce as many barriers to participation as possible. Um, the cost of, the attending those projects are heavily subsidized. So young people are paying as little as two pounds, three pounds per class to attend. Um, and as kind of a tutor, as a facilitator, um, you know, we're in the sessions delivering, delivering the work and, and seeing the impact that the arts um, and those sessions have on young people. So we're seeing that physical effect of, you know, in, increasing confidence and, um, 
resilience and you know how they communicate with other people in in the group um but for me it was really nice or a desire of of mine to to have some kind of physical um evidence to really back it up which is why i um kind of found out about torch um, and made an application and then i got to to meet baha in in a really lovely kind of uh uh <laughs> kind of meeting session where she talked a little bit about her research um and we found kind of real synergies in in what we were interested in jointly and how we could kind of collaborate on this project yeah yeah and it was all a bit out of the blue from my end personally because i didn't really know what to expect going into that lunch meeting that torch has set up very nicely set up for us and uh, yeah, like you say, it was very good to have that initial synergy and then just take it forward from that. Although, of course, it hasn't been that smooth, has it? <laughs> no, no. So I think the I, I can't even remember when the, the lunch meeting was, but obviously pre pandemic, we yeah. originally said that we were we we're going to deliver this project in person and we were going to, you know, be delivering it within the schools that the young people would attend to. We'd have control groups and all, you know, <laughs> yeah. all of this. And then, yeah, then the pandemic un unfortunately hit. Um, but we were still really keen to, uh, you know, deliver the project and work with young people um, at the same time. Um, and it kind of as it unfolded and we we adapted our, our planning and we adapted the study, which, uh, to be honest, Baha did all of the thinking behind uh, in terms of how it would run, what control groups we needed, how many groups, how many participants we needed to, to get. Um, by the time the project came around to, to actually delivering it, you know, as I said in the video, we had over 100 young people um, sign up to the project. And for me, that was, um, I guess, really reassuring that that, that young people were looking for things to do the project was free to attend and one of the benefits oh i'm jumping to the next question already but one of the benefits was that that young people could attend regardless of geographic location so we had young people from outside of oxford um signing up to be involved in this project and and that was yeah really really nice yeah yeah i fully agree and um, we had we weren't targeting neurodiverse populations necessarily, but we did end up having a couple of people with um, different needs that perhaps who perhaps wouldn't be able to join if it was live sessions. So I think that was very encouraging as well. Like you said, I was a bit apprehensive. So I will jump to the next question now, which was like, what did you fear um, the most going switching to the Zoom format because yeah, obviously we planned it to be delivered in person originally. And then we kind of spent the year of 2020 trying to figure out, okay, can we still deliver it in person if we wait long enough? Or should we start making contingency plans? And obviously we were making the contingency plans, but still really wishing that we could deliver it in person. But eventually we had to accept the fact and um, switch to the Zoom format. Um, so what do you think was your biggest fear as we made that switch? Um, I think for me, as someone who is, you know, used to delivering in-person sessions, you're working with those young people, you're, uh, you're forming those connections and those relationships. Um, for me, the, the biggest fear was how are young people going to form that those connections with with their peers how are, how are you going to build that relationship with young people that you've never met before you know over a, a screen um and that was yeah it was something that I was really very very nervous about going into the project um and yeah it took a, <laughs> a lot of kind of I guess yeah anxiety around how do we make this project you know really beneficial for the young people who are who have signed up um, to be a part of it how do we can make this the best experience it can possibly be so mm -hmm. that that for me was was the biggest uh, fear mm -hmm. how about you Baha? Um, I, I feared that too I feared whether the young people could actually engage with the sessions as they normally would but from my scientist perspective as well I was very worried about numbers because like I, I'm not a dancer but 
I was also I also started joining some dance lessons throughout the pandemic and I felt it within myself as well although I felt like I really need it and it's good for me your motivation to join session after session just decreases over time because you don't have the same incentives as you would in a normal like face-to-face -face session so I was a bit worried that we might lose loads of people as we go along but I think I, I, I don't think we lost more people than um, probably we lost more people than we would have, but not much more, I think. Uh, I, yeah, my fears were a bit exaggerated, it turns out, luckily. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think Paul mentioned it earlier in his conversation with Emmy is that, you know, young people spent so much of their time learning mm. online and remotely that then to offer a program of dance online and to kind of work out how you mirror and how you kind of instruct um and which angle is best for the young people and how do you kind of uh spark that creativity um mm -hmm. yeah it, it is it's something that is really difficult but um i think as, as you said we managed to kind of um maintain those relationships and, and maintain those numbers throughout kind of the the five weeks so each group did a five week chunk of a project and we had four groups overall. Um, so yeah, it it worked all right. <laughs> it really what, do you think, what do you think about um, the point you mentioned about your fear, you know, uh, the connection young people would have with the others in the class? Because I, I feel like that is particularly hard to engage them with each other during a session. How, how did that work in your experience? Um, so we used um, breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. um, not in the first kind of Zoom session, because that would have been <laughs> really difficult to just put, put young people on the spot. But we used a combination of breakout sessions. We used kind of drama games at the beginning where people had to kind of um, interact on the screen with one another. But whilst they're in their breakout rooms, you know, some of the tasks were, OK, they've created two, two a count of eight. Now you have to teach your partner and put it together. So um, we I tried to kind of mimic what would happen in, in a face-to-face -face session as much as possible and to, to facilitate that between young people and, and hop into different breakout rooms um, to kind of, yeah, uh, help shape that. But it, yeah, yeah it's, it's tough and I don't necessarily think that it's the same. <laughs> it, mm -hmm. I mean, it's definitely not the same, but um, yeah, there were elements, I think. Yeah. Yeah, we all tried to get quite creative, didn't we? <laughs> that sounds like a brilliant way, though. So what do you think were some of the key successes? Like a bit provocative question, maybe, but is there anything you would keep? I, I know um, Paul and Emmy discussed it as well, like hybrid method, etc. cetera. Yeah, um, for me, uh, I think it was really nice. I definitely, because it was online, tried um, to implement a different kind of teaching strategy. So the use of images and, um, you know, music, we use symbols one week to create movement. And those are things that I wouldn't necessarily have kind of done in the face-to-face mm. -face, um, session straight off the back, but because we were online and, and uh, it was important for me to try and engage um, different young people in, with different kind of ways and styles and to kind of turn my teaching practice on its head. Um, those are things that I'll keep. I think there's something, we are now back face-to-face -face teaching in Barton and Blackbird Lees and it is so nice <laughs> to be teaching face-to-face. -face. I, I think it's just a feeling that you can't replicate as well on um, uh, online, but uh, you know, similar to Emmy and and to Paul, it it meant that we were able to work with young people um, and increase our reach. Yeah. Um, it meant that yes, yeah, certain young people who perhaps wouldn't have signed up to our face to face classes were able to access that in the comfort of their own home. I think there was a um, a lot of the young people that we usually work with um didn't necessarily sign up to this project and i think there was a big a big part of it was that actually learning online wasn't appropriate 
appropriate for them. They didn't have necessarily a quiet space in their house or they didn't have the right equipment at home because they had to share with, you know, siblings or parents. And I think there are pros and, and obviously there are cons, um, but we're talking about successes. So um, yeah, just being able to increase our reach, being able to work with more young people and being able to provide a project where they got to be creative for an hour and 15 minutes every week mm -hmm. um, and they got to forget about kind of the stresses of learning online or yeah. um yeah other things that were going on in in their lives at that point yeah how about you Baha? successes yeah um yeah like i said i think the fact that we didn't drop massively in numbers was a great success for um from the science point of view because we could have the numbers uh, to actually do the analysis we need to do. Um, but also just seeing, so in, in just to maybe give a bit of sense to people as well. So as MJ was delivering and her team were delivering these uh, dance classes, we asked uh, certain questions to the young people, first at the beginning of the course and then at the end. And some of those questions we asked on purpose were open-ended questions so they could express themselves. And it was really nice to see just what a difference it made to those people's lives to the young people's lives like so some of the comments they gave were sort of heartbreaking as well saying you know they really needed it they've been feeling very lonely etc all of which are very understandable in the context of covid19 but it was also really nice to see that they they saw some important benefits in engaging with the dance lessons i think that is the biggest success really yeah, absolutely. And um, Baha, first, so two quick questions. Um, so one is, um, when can we, because obviously this will be pu published. Uh, so when when are we expecting to, to see the publication? Um, probably, so publications occur in a very different time frame, generally. Um, I am planning to do finalize the analysis and uh, write up the paper in the next few months but usually from the first time we submit a paper to a journal until it actually gets published is about six month period so there is going to be a gap but probably in the next year in 2022 we will see it but i i can't quite tell exactly when it will be great really exciting um and uh what what would you like to do next Baha? as sort of our last question like what's next uh, well, you know, I still have a big appetite for trying this in person as well <laughs> um, and getting a bit more information about which particular aspects of the dance program the young people benefited from and in which ways, because, you know, we talk about uh, the program affecting their well-being, their connections with their peers and also with their community, increasing their resilience because they learn to do something and become able uh, become more confident and everything but probably different aspects of the program contribute to these different outcomes so I would be quite keen on trying to map those uh, those links how about you what do you want to do next well we we spoke about it yesterday didn't we Baha is is um for me you know as, as a as an organization that relies heavily on on funding you know it'd be a large part of kind of my steps moving forward are about formalizing how we measure impact and evaluation um i think so that we can start kind of shouting and spreading the word about you know what we're doing and what we're delivering but also so that those kind of um measures are in place to, to every aspect of of our delivery whether that's producing hip-hop theater for the stage or kind of uh delivering outreach sessions within the local community and mm -hmm. um, so it's something that i don't want this um uh, relationship or collaboration to to stop right now i think there's more there's definitely more to explore um going forwards yeah absolutely brilliant um and i think we're gonna um bring ruth back in now for kind of a, a Q I was going to say post show talk. Sorry, that's a, a Q and A. <laughs> Sorry, Ruth. Thanks, MJ. And um, hello to everybody. If you haven't met me before, my name is Ruth Moore, and I'm the theatres officer here at Torch. Um, 
thank you to both of you for sharing that. I feel like you took us on a really um, kind of in-depth dive through the way that your collaboration has developed over this period of time, which wasn't as any of us had expected. And of course, you've been modest, but you've demonstrated an extraordinary amount of adaptivity and, and resilience as, as you've made this project happen despite everything. Um, we're going to bring the other panelists back on screen in a little while so that because I know we've got questions coming in from our audience, but I just wanted to ask you something first that's specific to you. Um, at the beginning, you were talking about how you two came to meet um, and sometimes um, the kind of the way in which you met is something that Torch has done in the past. Um, these connections between researchers and artists can come about organically because you've met in a context, but sometimes we want to make sure there are opportunities for a researcher who's never done something like this, but would like to, or an artist who hasn't, who would like to, to meet. Um, but you talked about it being a lunch in a room, and because we're talking about what happens when you bring things online, I'm really curious to know whether you think that this partnership would have got off the ground had it had to start online. Um, well, the sandwiches that we were given as well, Ruth, were very, <laughs> were great. Um, no, absolutely. I think um, for me, Zoom is, has been uh, brilliant. I, I have a producer and I have a, a marketing manager who work a day a week for me at the moment, and I've never met them in person. So I think that, you know, Zoom has a really great ability to, I mean, it's not the same, um, but you know, it's, it's, it's the next best thing. And I think, um, yeah, it's definitely opened doors and given more opportunities for collaboration. So um, sandwiches aside, I, <laughs> I think, I think it would have been, yeah, it would have been the same. I don't know about you, Baha. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely agree. And like you, I have several projects that I am doing with other people whom I haven't met in real life. <laughs> uh, we started the projects during the COVID-19 and still continuing. And yeah, it is different. Maybe it takes a bit more effort sometimes to continue the contact, um, but it, it's, it's doable. And yeah, I, I'm pretty sure we would have um, run this project even if the lunch was a virtual lunch. <laughs> Thank you. It's really good to know that, that these things um, will get off the ground in, in all sorts of ways. And I suppose it mirrors that, um, that amazing way in which you've witnessed young people take part in things, despite it not necessarily being the way that, um, that they might have, have wanted to initially. Um, we're going to invite Emmy and Paul to join us again on screen so we can start taking um, some questions. Um, while they're doing that, um, I'll just mention a couple of things quickly. One is that we're conscious that those of you who have come along um, to this webinar today might have done so because you're running participatory projects online yourselves at the moment or you're thinking about doing so. And I just wanted to say that if you want to just say a little something about a project as you pose a question to the panel, um, you're really welcome to do that. Please be aware that we're recording this session, so only mention things that you're happy for us to talk about on the record, um, but that's fine to do if you want to, or if you have some more general questions about how something worked that you've heard the panel mention, um, or just a, a general reflection you want to offer, you're really welcome to do that. Um, before I take the first of those questions from the Q&A box, I also wanted to let you know um, that the Journal of Applied Arts and Health Art-Based Research, um, they're, they're having a special issue about health and well-being during the pandemic. Um, and they just asked us to share that with you. They've got a call for papers out at the moment. Um, so um, we'll share the, the link for that in the chat in just a little while, um, just in case anybody who's part of this webinar today or our panel indeed might be interested in contributing something to that issue. Okay, so we're gonna head over and start answering some of your questions. And this is one that came in um, towards the start. So the question is, did you work with learning disabled participants and did you find you revamped your approaches to access for them to feel digitally empowered too? Um, I'll just say to our panel now that if of any of these questions, feel free to just jump in if you've got um, something that you would like to say to that one. Yeah, I mean, I, I can jump in here. Um, so as Emmy and I discussed in, in our conversation earlier, um, 
one of the organizations that that we're working with is uh, Keen. Um, and actually what was really great to hear about what uh, MJ and Bahar have just been talking about was actually the, the opportunities for new partnerships in this time, um, which is just another good thing that's come out of the last year. Um, we've worked quite hard with Keen to um, really establish the needs of our participants in those sessions and actually for for the benefit of ensuring that everybody is able to participate in the way we want them to particularly those uh you know with additional needs uh we've increased the amount of staff that are in our sessions so we we, we don't just have one or two facilitators we've got multiple who are really able to give that kind of one-to-one -one attention that that might be needed um as I mentioned earlier as well, we've also thought about kind of things like captioning and uh, we're moving towards really widening our efforts with BSL and Makaton moving forward as well and how that can be integrated more into our sessions as we move forward into the hybrid as we, as we were discussing earlier. Um, but more than anything, I think this has just provided us a real opportunity to just say we've, we've always known the importance of inclusion and we've always known that this is an opportunity to, to ensure that everybody gets the same chance to be creative and, and together. And, you know, we've, we've not tried to kind of tiptoe our way through Zoom and, and, and kind of assume that barriers are in place for people. We've, we've tried to use this as a place for, for young people just to be as expressive as, as they want to be. And I think as facilitators, it was a point that MJ was raising just now about that kind of nervousness about facilitating in this format. And I totally share that MJ, it, it was a complete, you know, new territory for us. Um, you know, we have learned to be a lot more patient and a lot slower within our practice and not assumed that we can just kind of race through the amount of work that we may have done in the rehearsal room. You know, this was really about slowing down and really understanding the well-being of those that were with us, um, which of course we were doing in person, but really, really taking that time now to reach out and to to, to see what those needs were. So um yeah, I don't know if that has answered the question, but that's kind of been our approach really to, to just really widening that access as much as possible. One of the things that um, we did that I think was helpful <clears throat> was to produce a mini guide about the Zoom sessions that also had some kind of visual pictures along with it so that participants, and we do have, we work with a lot of young people, um, who are from the learning disability community. And, and I think those sorts of visual prompts prior to a change is really important. Um, Paul and I realized when we took the raw partnership meetings online, um, one of the good things is that we were then able to um, invite some members of the Raw Sims, which is our um, disabled adult activist art group um, to the raw partnership space and um, one of the things we realized is that we needed to make sure that the agenda was um, an easy read agenda. So I think there's a huge amount more that needs to be done in terms of easy read um, information. So if you've got a Zoom session in an ideal world, you know, arts organizations would have the resource available for someone in, in who is trained um, in how to produce easy read resources to be able to produce an easy read session guide for each session that would be my kind of ideal best practice and that that would get sent out to all participants before each zoom session um, and i think that's very much the direction we want to go in and um, the other thing that we did in terms of revamping was i think linked to what you were just saying paul around being much slower around the pace and realizing that the space to talk about mental health and well-being was really important because a lot of the participants of learning disabilities that we were working with had been so isolated lots of them had been shielding through the pandemic and actually a good chunk of every weekly session um, that was led by one of our artists and then we had a pastoral staff member who was kind of responsible for safeguarding and well-being was also present but a really significant chunk of every session was space just to talk um, and that's actually just as meaningful as the creative activity that follows and just being realistic about those needs and making sure that they're being met and we probably wouldn't have in the space given as much time we, we have a check-in at the beginning of every session but that just felt like it needed much more kind of weight <clears throat> weight in the space um, and the other thing we did was uh, look at 
making sure that we were interrupting kind of instructions for creative activities with showing kind of inspirational content. So we'd share the screen and have either videos, um, kind of short clips or um, bits of exhibitions that were being produced by disabled artists around the world as a result of their response to the pandemic. And so we'd kind of interrupt our own um, activity with um, showing some inspirational stuff. And I think just that break between doing and then sitting back and being able to watch really helped people to kind of sustain focus. I think one of the things that was really challenge is challenging about the Zoom space is people not necessarily being so much in their bodies. And I'm really interested by, obviously with MJ, your work, you were absolutely fully embodied in, in your practice. And it must have been um, so empowering for young people to have felt that in contrast to their online learning spaces, whereas a lot of our visual arts Zoom sessions I felt were probably not giving young people enough time to get back into their bodies, um, which is such an important part of the work that we're doing. Thank you, both of you. And actually really interestingly, you've, you've been answering the second of the questions that came in, which was, was referencing really, how do we manage to use arts themselves to help people, um, um, use online systems and, and create that kind of understanding of being in space and a, and a comfort with being in the space. So I think the way in which you've been describing that um, absolutely speaks to that question as well. Um, I wonder, MJ, if there's just anything else in terms of how you really got your young people used to the format in which you were in anything that you found particularly effective or even anything that that you did that you could see in in the moment just wasn't flying and and you had to adapt and always always some adaption but um we actually had um sort of an intro session um before we launched into um the project obviously young people um had signed up to the project knowing that it was a, a dance and research study but we had a half an hour kind of intro taster where Bahar and myself talked through kind of what they would expect, um, what the questions uh, might be like that they would be answering as part of that questionnaire um, and then sort of the structure of the session. So similar to kind of what Emmy and Paul were saying, like it, it's important that young people aren't going into these things blind and, and you know, not knowing kind of what, what to expect. I think, um, you know, there's, there was so much uncertainty happening um, that it's just really important. And I really um, liked uh, kind of Emmy's little easy read booklet roadmap um, thing. I think that's a really, really lovely idea um, that uh, the ARCT used for their young people. Um, so we had our taster sessions and then, you know, at the beginning of each session, it would the, the same format. So there weren't any surprises. We we started with a game, a check in. We then did a, a bit of a hit warm up, which, you know, easy kind of movements to to get people moving and sweating and using their bodies and shaking off the day. And then we'd learn a bit of kind of choreography movement followed by kind of a creative task to kind of pull it all together at the end. Uh, and that was the structure, you know, it didn't change each week. What we did each week within those sections changed. Um, so there were different kind of creative tasks, there were different kind of movement to learn, but yeah, the format was the same. And I think that that, that is important um, that the young people feel safe and secure. It's another kind of aspect to kind of really help build those relationships that there's no surprises. I've had another question come in, which is um, a nice, it's a technical one, I suppose, to people who try and get these projects off the ground. It's um, to MJ and Bahar initially, but I think probably Emmy and Paul will, will also have thoughts on this. So the question is, um, how did you market towards and register young people online? Um, it feels so important to retain those applicants in early communications. So yeah, how did you get people's interest to do the young people's interest to do these projects and keep it to the point at which they showed up on Zoom that first day? Um, so we um, sent our kind of 
uh, <laughs> campaign, I guess, um, to a lot of the Oxford partnerships. So Active Oxfordshire had sent out to um, the, their schools networks. Um, we Access Sport also sent it um, nationally um, because they're a partner, Dancing Oxford. Um, had also shared it with with their kind of networks but further than that we um, did a lot of kind of social swaps with um, theatres and venues such as The Place or Boy Blue um, which is a, a hip-hop theatre company based in London so we have kind of partnerships and and relationships with with I guess national um, partners outside of Oxford which kind of really helped us um, engage young people from different areas uh, geographical areas in in the UK um, so we we did rely we did a big push we relied very heavily on kind of um, other organizations who are working with young people who um, were also kind of hit by the pandemic so shared that kind of uh, I guess sort of solidarity in, in how do we reach the young people that we really want to engage with? How do we kind of um, make sure that young people have those opportunities, those continued opportunities to be creative? We all know that it's really important for those young people to, to have those opportunities. So I think there was a real kind of, yeah, movement in solidarity, um, but it, it got pushed very, very broadly. Um, and just, you know, I guess, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, press. Uh, yeah, we had a mail out in the Oxford Mail as well. So yeah, just uh, there was a big, big marketing campaign. We relied a lot on, on our partners, which was brilliant that they were supporting and sharing the work. Yeah, just to add to that, um, we also had Torture's support there as well. Um, we had a little press release that was sent to some uh, some media and um, I, I spoke in a couple of radio programs and one of them was a bit cheeky that's why I was laughing because like um, that was actually before we had the press release I was listening to the radio one morning and um, there was a talk of mental health and well-being especially in young people how it's so affected and uh, how arts is also affected and I just thought and yeah the question that the host was asking was what has helped you throughout the pandemic to get over the pandemic blues and i thought well that's a brilliant way to <laughs> ring up the radio and say well actually <laughs> we have something that might help <laughs> and um yeah that actually worked uh, i didn't end up speaking there and then but um when we had the press release then that uh, was a way for me to advertise the projects and I, yeah again not necessarily to oxford but to different places as well and lots of Twittering, Instagramming, and so on. Um, but I think overall we advertised maybe just under two weeks. Is that right, MJ? It wasn't a long period of advertising. That's what I'm trying to say. It was intense, but it wasn't too long. So once you have the right materials, I think just a, um, just a rush was enough to get so many people. Yeah, I suppose it, it was a project which launched during this period, so you had to go from scratch to get people involved. Um, Emmy and Paul, I'm wondering whether you had things that you were really on a, a push to get new participants involved in, or did you feel that quite a lot of the work you were doing was around your existing communities? Um, a real mix, a real mix. I mean, uh, in some respects, we were, uh, you know, some of that initial stage of certainly, you know, the first lockdown was about how can we keep people engaged that we knew we had been working with um, but obviously as as we've discussed you know the, the the kind of new barriers and the the new priorities that we were able to identify across the year you know did present us with the the need to reach out and we uh, for, for I touched on it briefly earlier we we have a project called tea talks which uh, takes place over the phone with local later in life uh, people who you know might otherwise be quite socially isolated and, and vulnerable in this time um, we made use of a, a really really great connection of social prescribers you know who come from the health sector and come from uh, you know even research sectors within, within the university um, which has just been great I, I touched on partnerships earlier as well about how you know we, we've used this opportunity to really find those networks that we know can can really reach out to the people we need to um, you know, and I kind of I, I really congratulate that about the whole of the city of Oxford and how 
we are very reliant on one another to make things happen. It's one of the, the things I love about living in the city, um, you know, and, and Torch as well, that, that connection with researchers that, that you're able to present with us. Um, but another thing I was going to kind of add to that, it kind of echoes on what MJ was talking about just now with social media, and I know Baha, you touched on it as well, was we, we learned a lot from our participants that we were with. And, you know, for, for the majority of that it is young people who know far more about TikTok and Instagram than I do, you know, so to kind of learn from them and actually see how they can teach us to connect and push things in, in one way or another has just been another really wonderful thing that we've been able to kind of, you know, adapt and, and encapsulate in this time. Thank you. Um, we've had a question come in that's not so much about the specific um, projects that you might do, it's, but it's more to do with things that you've all referenced already about um, caring for the communities that are around your, your work or your organisations. Um, someone has said that there's been, um, I guess, for, for a long time, virtual communities online that are associated with gaming platforms or other spaces like Second Life. And um, this person is asking whether there is a way for us to get the learning from those spaces and people involved to create virtual communities. So I suppose these would be virtual communities that were around the idea of, of the arts and, and how participation in the arts and in research is, is beneficial. Um, I'm wondering whether you have had any, any kind of ventures into using different ways of maintaining online community that you haven't already had the chance to reference during our time. That's a really great question. Um, game, the gaming world, especially the Second Life kind of thing, makes me so nervous from a kind of safeguarding perspective because mm -hmm. I've heard so many horror stories about how you know young people can be reached out to in these in these spaces. But that doesn't mean that it has to be you know a, a constant danger. I know you know as all of us have, we've adapted across this year to make things safe and to and to account for these things. Um, as at the theatre, it's not necessarily coming from a participatory. Uh, kind of stance but we're, we're quite excited by what gaming can do for theatre and performance and how actually we can create that digital realm and you know make a shared experience digital for the sake of it actually being digital and not just as a kind of you know in between or hybrid for, for the need to provide a digital format. Um, so I am quite excited by what gaming could do and what we could learn um, but as I say I'm also quite nervous at the same time so <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I think that's a, a sort of excitement and caution that's, that's, that's shared across the boards. Um, there's one more question. Sorry, go on. I don't have any personal experience to report on it, but kind of uh, I'm seeing Melissa's question now as well, which is, I guess, what you were going to jump into, maybe linking to that too. I feel like the success, uh, well, one of the main reasons why gaming platforms are so successful at creating virtual communities is because um, the participants, the young people in that case, are quite active in those platforms. So they're not just, you know, receiving something, but they are contributing to it. And it becomes, uh, th there is a culture around it, uh, certain ways of saying things, certain ways of doing things that they have their own little norms there. Um, so I think if we wanted to learn anything from those platforms to apply to other, uh, to creating other types of communities, it is those things that would be quite important to take, not the safeguarding, <laughs> not the aspects that um, are potentially been, um, harmful for safeguarding. But um, yeah, they have quite good engagement of the people, like the active engagement of the people. Yeah, and just to, to broaden that out to this final question from, from the audience, which was asking um, what strategies are effective to address online fatigue is it down to using different modes of, of sensory engagement? And um, so I think that's a, that's a really good point about uh, what that kind of um, virtual community can do, but do others have experience of, of things which you've seen work to address those moments when young people or others engaged in projects are clearly beginning to, to flag because this is a, a hard space to be in for a length of time? I mean, I think one of the things we learned pretty quickly is that a 60 minute session was the sweet spot. Um, so initially we did it when we're up and running in the centres, our sessions all last um, two hours, some of them are 90 minutes, but within the two hour spaces, 
you know, a good break where people, um, participants have the chance to hang out um, and connect. And online, it was just quick, very ap apparent quite quickly that that was way too long um, for people to stay on the screen. So we reduced our session time. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the strategies that has worked well um, is also having activities where people can go away, turn their screen off um, for 15 or 20 minutes, get on with their activity in their, in their home and in their space, and then come back to the camera, switch it on and feedback. So you're not actually spending the whole 60 minutes online. You've got that kind of space at the beginning to connect, set it up, um, turn off the screen, come back and see your space and then, and then rejoin. And I think that's worked really well. Um, and I also think that physical icebreakers at the beginning, um, which encourage people to interact with their environment, um, that have been really positive. So go and find three things that are the color red from your kitchen and bring them back and make up a story about them. Um, so you're actually getting people up, engaging with their environment, physically um, moving around and then coming back. Those are sorts of little tricks I think have been really helpful for keeping people fresh. It feels like a good moment to make sure that we're moving towards the conclusion of our event because we're really grateful to our panellists and to people who've come to have been online for this time with us. There is one last thing that I would really um, like to ask. Um, I'm just seeing actually there's one last question that has come in on the chat so we'll just see if we can um, squeeze that in before I, I ask my final one. Um, so there's a question around whether safeguarding issues might be similar to those you experience in person, um, this person is saying that there is more control within a virtual space, that you can kick people out, create space that's private, you can have contingency plans like ending the session, and all of those things are, are certainly true. I wonder what you think about that, whether, um, whether you do think that you can put more safeguarding protections in space and online sessions, or whether there are other drawbacks that, that perhaps haven't been mentioned there. Um, it depends if I mean, if you're using breakout rooms and if we're all familiar with breakout rooms, you as the host can't be present in all of those breakout rooms at any time. You can dip in and move around, um, but ultimately there might be moments in time where young people are together in a space, uh, in a virtual space, and, and you can't control that. I think when you're in a studio or in a room, you know, you are <laughs> managing everything that goes on and you're kind of overseeing all of the, um, you know, you know, people's behave, like how they're holding themselves and, and you're just aware of things a little bit more. I think it's, it is a bit harder to control that environment um, in a virtual space. Um, if you don't use breakout rooms, then perhaps, um, yeah, haven't really, <laughs> haven't got any more to add on, on that. But yeah, just breakout rooms are a little bit more tricky to manage, I think. Also, I mean, if you're running a session in the centre, you would risk assess the activity and there'd be one risk assessment. But essentially you're carrying out an activity with up to 20 environments that you're working with and you can't risk assess all of those individuals' environments. Um, so there is increased risk there. But as MJ said, when you're facilitating a session in person because you're um, able to see young people um, in the flesh you're able to pick up on safeguarding concerns that you just won't be able to get a sense of virtually so you might notice marks on arms for example um, or shifts subtle shifts in behaviors which in the space are so much more tangible or kind of obvious and much harder to pick up so one of the things that you know happens at RT is that we are um, ready to be able to support young people to disclose you know we're not just waiting for a disclosure to come of a safeguarding issue we're kind of creating an environment that's very safe so that young people feel encouraged to be able to share if they're worried about anything at home or school and on an online space there's no privacy where a young person can really have that interaction with you as a facilitator it feels a lot more exposing i do think there are real issues around kind of ability for our organizations to do what we do alongside being an arts organization which is we are one of the safeguarding presence presences in young people's lives um, and, and play a very active role when when we're with those young people and are following their journeys it's just we just haven't had that same quality of relationship over the pandemic that's that's really 
problematic um also just around environments at home we don't know who is at home necessarily all the time with that young person in the background um and so there is a level of risk that we're we're sometimes not able to gauge in terms of who's at home and levels of safety um which you know can be challenging which is why we had to do quite a lot of work on developing an online safeguarding policy um to try and mitigate some of it yeah, thank you. And actually, that does move us towards what I wanted to ask. Finally, of course, we, we wanted this session to to celebrate lots of the possibilities of, of taking these kind of this kind of work online and also look at the ways in which you would want to continue doing this in, in the months and years to come. And you, you've all addressed that quite extensively in terms of the particular communities that this might work best for. Um, but I did want to, to kind of bring us back um, finally to that that thought of that quite often in, in these kind of works we do have that sense that something happens when you are in the room the physical room um that that might not happen online and emmy you've begun to address that by just thinking about the safety side of that and what we can see and sense and and, and make space for and make safe space for so i just wanted to give you all the opportunity as we close to say um i suppose what you're most looking forward to about being back in physical spaces to do the kind of work that you do not to say that we're going to abandon all of this but what are you most looking forward to about um real sessions as they start up again i know mj that's already the case for you um yeah just uh that it's just so nice to be um around young people to have young people in a space where they are enjoying themselves where they're expressing themselves it's just yeah as a facilitator i think there is is nothing like it we also have now also ugh, have now also also um sorry uh zoom fatigue um we <laughs> have uh, launched uh, a youth assistant program so we have um some of our older uh, young people who have done a dance leadership program with us who are now kind of facilitating and getting paid work to support our five to seven year olds, um, which is just really great for them. So it's giving them kind of um, opportunity, leadership um, and money as well, money in the bank, which is, is, is something I think uh, young people need to feel kind of supported and wanted and um, useful especially coming out of this kind of pandemic and and they are like brilliant and it, yeah I think I'm not coherently saying it but to be back with young people face to face is just it is great <laughs> it's so great I'll let someone else more articulately say something now I think my background is um in drama facilitation and I think one of the things that I was thinking about uh earlier today was that it's it's just about emotional connection and that's what's been lacking for me really in terms of the zoom space we can get a sense of comfort from being connected virtually i think and a sense that we are connected and that we're being remembered and held in mind um and we can still use our voices or if we don't use our voices we can still use our bodies and all of those things are really important parts of being human but when you're in a physical space with other people there is so much unsaid um, and non-verbal communication that is taking place that is bonding you as a group that I just don't think can be replicated online and it's that it's an emotional connection it's the stuff we feel between the hearts of people who are in a space and it's those little tiny moments the subtle um, acknowledgements that we make to one another um, in our gestures you know that that is that has been lost or certainly diminished and that's what i'm looking forward to because i know that when i'm with a group and facilitating and that the, you can actually feel and track the change in energy and group connection everybody's bodies start changing and interacting with each other in a deeper way and you know that buzz you get from it i just don't think i personally felt that same level of like connection emotional rich connection that you get in person but i could just be old-fashioned <laughs> i would i would agree with you emmy and um 
I think to build on it, um, we at, at the the very start of the the first lockdown, um, as has been discussed throughout this conversation, you know, financial challenges presented themselves, and um, for for our entire organisations, and we reached out to our communities about, you know why did they love what we did? Why, why, why was our organization important to them? And um, some of the responses we got were so heartwarming to hear that, I mean, one in particular stands out that they met as a member of one of our youth theater groups when they were a teenager. Uh, they're now in their late twenties and they're married. And it's kind of like it's those, you know, relationships that we can actually form and those friendships as well that happen in the room that I'm just so looking forward to seeing young people you know, forming bonds that, you know, they're going to, that, that are going to last a lifetime and, and be so important to them. And I think all of us that are involved in uh, not just performing arts, but, but, but any kind of like collective activity, we know how long lasting those relationships are. And often they're the thing we remember the most about those activities. Um, and I think actually that's, that's what I, similar to what Emmy's just been saying, getting back and seeing those bonds come to life is, is, what I'm really looking forward to. I'll just um, kind of echo what has been said um, from a research point of view as well. So my work and the other people's work at the Social Body Lab in Oxford as well, have been looking at these kinds of nonverbal cues that we use to communicate with each other. And then that ultimately make us feel more bonded with some people, but not others. And they're so subtle, like Amy was saying, it could be just a, small um you know eye gaze that you share or it might be a little touch on the shoulder or even not no in the absence of touch it could just be that you come um kind of involuntarily without thinking you come closer to the person you walk towards the person that you want to be with and you start sharing more of the space together and that helps you understand that person better their emotions better and so on so there's all these very subtle um nonverbal cues in real life that we use consciously or unconsciously and it's very very hard I also think to mimic them in uh, in virtual interactions this is a very good substitute but it's it's not everything thank you all of you very much and um, before I do a, a final thank you to our panelists um, I just wanted to draw our audience's attention to you a couple of things. Um, the links for these are in the chat at the moment. So first is um, we really want to be able to do more of these kind of things and to make sure they're tailored really well to um, what is interesting and wanted. So there's a link there to a very quick survey. And if you have a moment to complete it, we really appreciate that. Um, you'll need to click on the link now so that it opens before the webinar is closed. Um, the other thing that's there is a link to book for the final event in this series that we've been doing and actually it's going to touch on a number of things that have come up today. Um, we are going to attempt a hybrid event so we're going to be live streaming from the old fire station in Oxford. We've got a couple more great double acts for you so our own Wes Williams is going to be speaking to Jeremy Spafford who is the head of the old fire station, the artistic director, about what kind of role the hybrid is going to play in programming decisions going forwards. And then we're going to have Professor Emma Smith, who's a professor in Shakespeare studies, talking to Sarah Ellis, who's the head of digital development at the RSC, um, about what might be retained of digital projects, what's going to be happening going forward. So there's all sorts of very interesting research going on um, around using things like gaming. Wes has put a note in the chat about this, um, looking at narrative form. There are many possibilities of all of this, but as we've just been hearing as well, some things which don't translate um, when you're online. So that event is going to be a real exploration of, um, of what possibilities we can take forwards into the future. Um, we're going to be live streaming it. If you sign up via that link, you'll be able to join us on YouTube and pose your questions live. Um, and we look forward to having lots of you involved in that. But for now, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to our panel for being involved today. We have appreciated your contributions so much and that you've been willing to share so honestly about the ups and downs of this period and, and what work you've been able to make from it. I think it's a real credit to you and to the communities that you work with um, that all this amazing stuff has happened. So thank you to the four of you and thank you to our audience for coming today. And we look forward to seeing you at another Torch event soon.